Hello and welcome to another episode of Positive Leadership, the podcast that helps you grow as an individual, as a leader, and eventually as a global citizen. My guest today, Dr. Martin Seligman, is director of the Penn Positive Psychology Center and a Penn Master of Applied Positive Psychology program, and a man widely credited as the founding father of positive psychology. 25 years ago, at a time when the dominant focus in psychology was on mental illness, pathology, and dysfunctions, Dr. Seligman felt that psychology should not only be about fixing problems, <laughs> but also about promoting and enhancing the positive aspects of human experience, such as happiness, fulfillment, and flourishing. An idea that was totally radical at the time. Since then, his ideas have come into the mainstream within his discipline, and have also reached a wider public. Dr. Seligman has authored more than 360 scholarly publications and 31 books, including the most recent book, Tomorrow Mind, Thriving at Work with Resilience, Creativity, and Connection. As a leader, I must say, Martin, I've personally drawn on your work again and again through my career to build my positive mindset and create an environment that enables people to flourish and do more. It is such an enormous pleasure and honor to have you, Martin, on the podcast. A warm welcome to you. Well, thanks for having me on, JP. So, Martin, I'd like to start at the very beginning of your journey, if I may. I think you were born in 1942 in New York and raised in a middle-class Jewish family. Can you draw a picture of what you were like as a child and, who, and what were the greatest influences of you growing up? Well, I think up until age 12, I was a pretty bright-eyed, uh, uh, bushy-tailed child. <laughs> and uh, at age 12, my sister, who was in college, would bring home her books. And she brought home Freud one day for me. So I'm lying in the hammock. I'm 12 years old. I'm reading Freud's introductory lectures. And he talks <laughs> about teeth falling out dreams. And well, uh, JP, do you remember what uh, for Freud that meant? I'm not sure. I know it's a common, actually, uh, dream, but no, I, I, I'm not. I'm, what is it, Martin? He said it was guilt over masturbation. Wow, okay. And <laughs> that's, I thought, that's a good start. <laughs> how does he know me so well? Uh, this is what I want to do in life and uh, have uh, great insights into human beings. And uh, uh, that was one influence. The other thing that happened yeah. at age 12, JP, Yes. is my father, who was 49 and a, a political mm. person, had a series of strokes. And mm. so I found myself in the position of uh, uh, not having a father, essentially, and having mm. to raise myself. And uh, the next major intellectual influence that happened to me was going off to college and yeah. uh, doing uh, science and studying at Wittgenstein in physics and... Uh, 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 rigorous uh, intellectual matters. And so the question I left college with was, how can I combine the rigors of science with hmm. the uh, insights that people like Freud had into uh, human illness and human happiness? So it was between my sister, Freud, my father's stroke, and Wittgenstein that uh, the cauldron... <laughs> Uh, that I am today developed. No, it's 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 uh, it's, it's amazing and uh, really interesting as well as I read your book, Martin, to understand that you've been going back and forth and connecting the dots between science, social sciences, and philosophy as well. No, you also were very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, passionate about philosophy. So I like now to really understand what made you want to study psychology. Well, if we go back to my teenage years, uh, you know, as sort of a short, non-athletic kid, uh, <laughs> watching all my athletic and wealthy friends get the girls, I asked myself, hmm, uh, what could I do? And it was talk to them about their problems. No one had ever done that before. And uh, uh, that was one way. And then the other, I think, was... Uh, 
uh, really the important one, and that was uh, combining scientific curiosity with wanting to change the world for the better. Yeah. And so in your biography and, and this book, uh, The Hub Circuit, you shared an insightful moment, which I love, with your daughter, Nikki, who was celebrating, I think, her fifth birthday. And she told you, hey, Dad, have you noticed that since uh, my fifth birthday, I've not whined once? You nodded, and she continues, well, on my birthday, I decided I was going to stop whining, <laughs> and that was the hardest thing I've ever done. And if I can stop whining, you can stop being such a grouch. So, so you take us back to the moment, to that moment, if you can. And why did it add such a big impact, I guess, on you as a dad, but also as an academic researcher? Well, it's 1996 now, and I had just been elected president of the American Psychological Association. And presidents are supposed to have initiatives and themes mm -hmm. And I really didn't know what mine would be. And so it was at that epiphany in the garden with Nikki in which uh, I shouted at her and told her to get to work weeding with me. And she called me a grouch and said that she was able to stop whining. And so uh, she could do that. I could stop being such a grouch. Um, in that moment, JP, uh, yeah. I learned three things. Uh, yeah. The first was that N Nikki was exactly right. I was a grouch, and I was proud of it. So a grouch is someone who uh, can see everything that's wrong and yeah. can criticize it. Uh, and indeed, I was proud of doing that. But for the first time in my life, it occurred to me that perhaps any success I had had in academia and in the world was not because of critical intelligence, but in spite of it. Uh, uh. And so uh, I resolved to look harder for what was right rather yeah. than for what was wrong. That was the hmm. first thing. Uh, and I also resolved to become a happier person. And indeed, mm -hmm. I measure that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. And it worked. The second was that I realized that my theory of being a parent or a teacher was mm. wrong. Uh, essentially, it was remedial. And that mm. somehow, if I could find all the things that Nikki was doing wrong and correct them, I'd get an exemplary child. And it occurred to me that was nonsense. Uh, that conversely, what I really needed to do was to find out what Nikki's strengths were. I had just seen yeah. one the ability to talk to an adult, uh, yeah. reinforce it and help her to lead her life around what she was good at as opposed to correcting what she was bad at. And the third thing I realized was that my profession, psychology, was half-baked. It was mm. baked about suffering and misery, uh, mm. but there was no science and no practice of the opposite about well-being and happiness. And so I got my presidential theme, and I've spent most of the last uh, almost 30 years since then working on well-being and happiness. Well, that's an incredible testament as well, and legacy forever from your daughter, uh, Nikki. Uh, what, 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 what a difference it makes to have a five-year kid, right? And, and <laughs> to give you to give you the reality, the evidence of what life is all about. So that's a wonderful story, uh, Martin. I'm so glad you shared it with all of our listeners. But back to your career, I think early in your career, the sense of mind had transformed into the sense of behavior, which I understand was about three pieces, stimulus, response, and reinforcer, which is connected to legendary work done by Ivan Pavlov. And you led some very advanced research on what you call learned helplessness. Can you briefly explain the idea of learned helplessness and the experiments you are doing, and more importantly, how those experiments help you change your quest for better understanding of the mind? Well, I'm 21 years old now, and uh, I've gone from uh, Princeton to the University of Pennsylvania, where I'm a first-year graduate student, and everyone is working on Pavlovian conditioning, in mm. which you present... Uh, stimulus and a 
outcome like food or shock. And yep. the person or animal learns the relationship between the stimulus and the outcome. Well, something else is going on in Pavlovian conditioning. There is nothing the subject can do to change the outcome. The subject hmm. is helpless. And so yeah. I said, hey, maybe that overrides these learning of associations. And indeed, we found with dogs and rats and people hmm. that yeah. uh, when they're exposed to events that they can't do anything about, for example, in Pavlovian conditioning, they become profoundly passive and they become hmm. stupid. Hmm. And uh, that launched me on a search for a laboratory model of human depression. So learned helplessness was the finding that when people yeah. are exposed to events they can't control, that it produces a profound passivity. Hmm. That's a, was, that's, that was a, a, an incredible insight, I guess, at the time where there was so much built, and still today in many, in many uh I would say context, you're going to hear see people talk about Pavlov as a, as a law of evidence for everything in life. And I think that that was a pretty deep insight. So you received a, your PhD in psych psychology in 1967 from the University of Pennsylvania and spent the first few decades of your career working on the relief of suffering, as you said, Martin. You, boo you looked at misery, schizophrenia, depression, and you were known in particular again for this work on learned helplessness. Then in 1998, you actually mentioned that already, you, you gave a, a now famous presidential address to the American Psychological Association in which you called for a shift in focus and resources toward the study of positive psychology. That address titled Positive Psychology, an introduction, is often considered a landmark moment in the establishment of positive psychology as a field of study. So given the different steps of your academic career we briefly discussed together, what triggered this speech uh, and what were the key moments of truth beyond, of course, this episode with Nikki that we talked about that got you to create and, and focus on positive psychology? Um, about two years before I was president of APA, uh, Consumer Reports enlisted me to do a study of therapy in the way they study automobiles and washing machines. And uh, so I helped them launch a large survey. And to my surprise, coming out of academia, which had basically debunked a lot of therapy, uh, yeah. we found that uh, 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 therapy was rated very highly. It was like a really good washing machine. And it occurred for me for the first time as an academic that uh, maybe this would be a route to bringing better science to APA, since APA mm. was mostly um, practitioners and it yeah. needed a dose of science. And indeed, uh, I decided to run for president of APA. I hadn't been president of anything since the ninth grade, and I wasn't mm -hmm. a very good ninth grade president for that matter. Uh, but uh, the incident with uh, Nikki in the garden, in which I realized that psychology had been uh, monomanically about misery and suffering, that it had missed so much of what people want in life. So yeah. those people listening to me now, when you go to bed at night, you generally are not thinking about how to go from minus eight to minus five in life. You're asking how to go to plus four and plus yeah. six. And where was the science and practice of that? And um, so it seemed to me a, a, an enormous lacuna in psychological yeah. thinking that it somehow missed the good life. Yeah what makes life worth living as a, hmm. in its endeavor to remove the things that cripple life. So it became my uh, passion and endeavor to get my fellow scientists and practitioners to work on the good life, what makes life worth living. Um, that was the inspiration. 
Well, I'm so glad you had such inspiration early on, Martin, so all of us can enjoy and, of course, learn more from you and many of your peers. You know, recently <coughs> I had Professor Kim Cameron on the podcast, who in 2002, a few years after your speech, founded the Center of Positive Organizations based at the University of Michigan. It's a world-class research center that has, that has played a key part in establishing what was then a new field management science. He told me that it took a while for people within the business community to grasp the importance of focusing on positive emotions, to understand it was not just about smiling your way through uh, each day, regardless of how you were feeling, to recognize the value in being able to be advanced in a way that's constructive and positive. So my question is, did you find it hard to persuade people early on on the importance of focusing on positive emotions, but also to get them to understand that authentic happiness comes from identifying and nurturing one's signature strengths and using them to achieve a state of flow. How hard was it to convince the early adopters <laughs> of positive psychology in different audiences, right? Business people, could be academia, could be citizen. Well, I was surprised about who didn't like positive psychology <laughs> and who did like it. And it would have been very hard for me to predict. So uh -huh. in the first place, I found that many of my clinical psychologists who had grown up uh, pathologizing the world and trying mm. to unpathologize it uh, resisted the notion that humans could do any better than not being miserable. Uh, yeah. Indeed, uh, the Freudian tradition was the best you can ever do in life is to hold your suffering to near zero. Yeah. So interestingly, uh, my fellow uh, psychotherapists uh, uh, yeah. met it with skepticism. Uh, we started working in schools, and it began to catch on there. So what we did was uh, we took uh, middle school kids uh, uh, at a, about age 10 to 12, and we yep. began to teach them the techniques of positive psychology and resilience. And then uh, we followed them through puberty, and we found mm -hmm. that we could have the rate of depression and anxiety by preventive uh, learning about mm -hmm. positive psychology. So it mm. took an education, and the place yep. where it really took JP was a great surprise to me. Mm. Um, this is in the middle of the Iraq-Afghanistan war. Uh, right. I got called to the Pentagon by the chief of staff of yep. the Army, George Casey, and uh, uh, to a meeting of the general staff. And mm. uh, uh, General Casey said, uh, positive psychology, hmm, we've got <laughs> depression, suicide, panic, divorce, mm. drug mm. abuse, PTSD. What does positive wow. psychology teach us about that? <laughs> and I said, sir, I'm, I went to military school, JP, so <laughs> I knew enough to say, sir, uh, you just yeah. described what soldiers go through when they face yeah. severe combat. But mm. the uh, reaction of soldiers and humans generally to bad mm. events uh, yeah. is uh, bell-shaped. You've described the left-hand side of the bell, mm. the people who fall apart. But yeah. what you have to remember, sir, is that in the middle you've got resilience. Now, resilience mm. is uh, have a hard time after combat, but three yeah. months later you're back where you were, both physically and psychologically. Mm, but yeah. often overlooked is the right-hand side of the curve. And these yeah. are people who do very badly in combat, who really suffer from it, often show PTSD symptoms, but a year later are stronger mm. physically and, and psychologically and than they were to begin with. Yeah. So my recommendation <laughs> is that we move the United States Army <laughs> to resilience, to wow. post-traumatic growth. And yeah. indeed, at that point, General Casey did something which I'll remember for the rest of my <laughs> life. He said, uh, uh, my legacy, Dr. Seligman, to the United States Army will be to create an army that is 
psychologically as strong as it is physically, and I'm allocating $140 million to it. And your wow. job will be to teach the Army positive psychology and resilience. And I said, well, uh... how can I do that? He said, well, we've got 40,000 <laughs> teachers in the Army. I said, really? And yeah, the drill sergeants. Yeah. So your wow. job will be to teach the 40,000 drill sergeants positive psychology, and they will teach the 1.1 million soldiers. And that was the, uh, the big uptake yeah. uh, for uh, positive psychology in the world. That's that's huge, Martin. And uh, if I may, we'll come back to that a bit later in some of the details, because I love as well the practicality, the exercise. We'll come back to that later. Uh, hang on for listeners. <laughs> but I also love you to talk a little bit about business circles. Have you also dealt with business people, you know, and the way they've been uh, approaching again positive psychology? Yes, the 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 major uptake in the last ten years has been yep. big corporations. And uh -huh. let me give you my background, JP, about this. Yep. So yep. I've been teaching uh, large groups of people happiness, well-being, and resilience. And when mm. I talk to CEOs about this, they would often say to me, well, that's nice, but my job is profit. Is <laughs> happiness profitable? And uh, <laughs> in, indeed, I knew the literature on this. There are about a 100 studies in which you measure the right. happiness of workers, and you measure yeah. their productivity, and maybe uh, <laughs> the more happy workers are, the more productivity. But something really major has happened in the last couple of years that yeah. uh, solidifies this and makes it uh, convincing for me. So the first thing was our studies in the United States Army. And mm -hmm. um, so, and by the way, JP here, Yep. Unlike most psychological work, I'm not talking about samples. I have everyone mm. in the Army. So this is a, <laughs> a study Massive. of uh, 900,000 soldiers. On oh. day one, when they sign up, it's a regulation that they take a test that yeah. um, I was part of the designing. And it asks about um, psychological well-being, ill-being, and the like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then we follow... 900,000 soldiers after day one for five years. And wow. uh, there are two big awards that uh, the Army gives for this. The first is exemplary work. It's medal. 12% mm. yep. of the Army earns it in five years. And heroism. So we asked mm. the question, could we predict from day one who's, who's going to do exemplary work? And by yeah. the way, the Army has 150 different jobs. This is not just infantry. Uh, yeah, yeah. We found we could robustly predict it. Three things on day one predicted exemplary work over the next five years. The first was high positive emotion on day mm. one. The second was high optimism on day one. And the third was low negative emotion, not being a complainer. Yeah. So yeah. that was the first thing that we learned mm. that pointed us in the direction of the importance of well-being for working well. But uh, the most important study came out uh, this May. Uh, Jean-Emmanuel Deneuve from Oxford, yeah. uh, George Wald from Harvard, took 1,100 American companies. Mm. Uh, at time one, uh, they asked four questions of the workers. Uh, yeah how happy you are at work, one to five, how satisfied are you with your job, how much purpose does your work mm. have, and how stressed are you, low stressed. Mm. Yep. And then uh, they measured at time one the stock price of the company and the profitability of the company. And then they came back uh, one year later, and they found that happiness, those four questions robustly predicted stock market price and profitability. So now when CEOs ask me, and I advocate uh, more well-being for workers, uh, and they say, well, is that profitable? I can say yes, and, and um, massively so. 
So it turns out yeah. that HR has a different job than I thought. So I basically regarded yeah. HR as being uh, hand-holding and making people yeah. feel better, but it is now clearly a major lever of profitability. That's right. And you think business people get convinced about that, Martin, that they actually are doing something about it? It's not just uh, nice words. You see some, some of them taking actions. Yes, and we finally have uh, evidence that from my scientific standards is convincing. So I think mm -hmm. one of the great drivers of well-being in the world for the future will be as it turns out to be profitable. Yeah, that's simple, simple equation. And I believe in it, by the way, me too, uh, in, in a huge way. And, and it's a virtual and virtual circle of people, satisfaction, wellness, Custom, driving customer satisfaction, by the way, which is so critical, driving loyalty and driving profit for the company. And I think it's, I've, sh I've seen that, I mean, again and again in different places, different companies, and it's, it's real. Yeah, no, so Martin, I'd like, uh, I'd like just, to go back. Just one Sorry. more thing on that, JP. Yes. So my yeah. message to CEOs now is one, hire happy people, and two, for the rest of your workforce, do coaching for well-being. Ah. Wow, that's a good formula too. I love it. I love it as well. A combination of that happy people and coaching together. That's that's a, that's a wonderful one. Martin, I'd like to go back to one of your historical frameworks that a number of people who studied your works and psychology know. It's called the PERMA model, and um, which is based on the idea that there are five essential elements that contribute to a fulfilling, meaningful life. So, for listeners who might not be yet familiar with the PERMA model, can you tell us what are those five essential elements and why you believe they are so important for human flourishing? So once you've decided, as I did, to work on human happiness, the question is, what is it? Uh, mm -hmm. The word happiness itself is so fuzzy that it's really yeah. not very helpful. So uh, theoretically, I believe there are five different pillars of human happiness. Uh, PERMA is the acronym for it, and P is positive emotion, high subjective well-being. Uh, but the reason that positive psychology doesn't stop at P and say that's all you should work on is how people mm. feel, is that um, how we feel, subjective well-being, is highly heritable. And what that means is that 50% of the world right now, it really is not feeling very good. So yeah. what else is there to human happiness? Well, the second thing is E, and that for me is engagement. Uh, when does time stop for you? When do you feel completely at home? Uh, and uh, so the second pillar of positive psychology is how to measure and how to build engagement with the people you love, in your hobbies, and most importantly, at work. Uh, yeah. The third thing that is the pillar of human happiness is our relationships. We're hive creatures. And mm -hmm. uh, indeed, I'm, I'm often asked if you're depressed right now, what's the one thing you can do? And uh, uh, here's my advice generally for that. You should shut off this podcast, go outside, <laughs> find okay. someone who needs help, and help yeah. them. It turns out yeah. our hedonic system is wired uh, yeah. to generosity and to help. Mm. So building mm. relationships and studying them is the third pillar of positive psychology. The fourth pillar is uh, M, and that I used to call that meaning. Uh, mm -hmm. belonging to and serving something yeah. bigger than you are. And indeed, uh, measuring that and asking how to build it uh, has been a main endeavor in positive psychology. And so, for example, sure. when uh, in the workplace, when people see their work as meaningful, uh, mm. they're more productive and retention is better. And the last is A, and that's achievement. Mm. mastery, accomplishment. Yeah. So uh, the way we... <clears throat> <coughs> the, 
The way we measure human happiness is with a dashboard. P, yeah. how you're feeling right now. E, how engaged are you? R, how good are your relationships? M, how much meaning do you have in life? And A, how is your accomplishment going? That's a very, very uh, strong foundation, Martin. And uh, I guess, I mean, we'll discuss more of that a bit later. I mean, the M for meaning can real, can connect a lot with the purpose, uh, uh, purpose-led as well, uh, you know, organizations and the purpose of, of people. Uh, now, we are in 2023. Uh, if you had to start that uh, framework over again, would you actually just keep it as it is, those five letters and those five key components, or would you do something a bit different? Would you change? Would you add? Would you amend? <laughs> would you come up with a new acronym today, Martin? Um, M has changed for me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when we ask people about meaning, you know, how meaningful is our conversation today, JP, it, yeah. people see that as kind of pointy-headed and hard mm -hmm. to answer. But right. there's another question which we now do in companies and uh, around the world. It's a different M. It's mattering. To what mm. extent do you make a difference to your family, to your corporation, to the planet? And if you vanished right now, what would the consequences be? People are much better at answering mattering questions than meaning questions. And very mm. important for managers, uh, there are things you can do to increase the amount of mattering that people feel uh, on a team, for example. But it's very difficult to change the amount of meaning they have. So the mm. one change I'd make uh, is M migrating to mattering from meaning. Mattering. No, I, l I love the way you've been defining mattering, uh, actually, uh Martin, both uh, starting with the family, continue with the organizations you work for, business, I mean, it could be civil society, and eventually the planet, humanity as well, which I think is a, we'll come back to that as well, which is the, the, the third kind of circle of the impact we can have on the, on the world. Now, you talked, uh, uh, you know, about this amazing story of the work you did with the army, which is really mind-blowing, because when I was reading that also in your book, think about the I mean, the one million people scale of the programs. I'd love you, maybe, if you don't mind, coming back on some very specific elements. You talk about a questionnaire, then you talk about a way you measure prediction again of, again of resiliency and more. Uh, what have been some of the key techniques you've been, if you were to pick, I know there's, I'm sure, a lot in the handbook and the training materials, but you have to pick a couple of the most important principles for the managers, I would say, okay, uh, lieutenants, whatever, <laughs> generals of the army, different levels of management. But let's take first level of management in the army. What would be the top two, three key, 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 key uh, coaching advice you would give them? Well, the first, oddly enough, comes out of marital therapy. And it's ah. uh, massively uh, important in the workplace and in the army. Now, Marital therapy traditionally studies how people fight. And indeed, mm. in marital therapy, what you're trying to do is to make them fight more constructively. That is, you're trying to change uh, insufferable marriages into barely tolerable marriages. Well, yeah. that's not positive psychology. Positive <laughs> psychology is about the question of how to create good relationships, not less yeah. bad relationships. Yeah. Now, uh, about 15 years ago, in the field of positive marriage counseling, people asked the question, not how do you fight, but how do you celebrate together? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I want you to imagine uh, your spouse comes home with a victory, some really good thing. What do you say to her? 
Congratulations. Well, there's a two by wonderful yes. achievement. <laughs> uh, congratulations, <laughs> wonderful. Let me that doesn't do anything. Let me tell you okay, about that. Okay, okay. <laughs> so consider a two by two table in which yeah. active, passive, constructive, destructive are the first mm. two dimensions. Yeah. So uh, Mandy, my wife, is a amateur black and white photographer. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, she came downstairs and said, Marty, um, the editor of Black and White uh, just called me. I've won first prize in Black and White. Uh, wow. So what do I say to Mandy when she says that? Well, what you and I both would have done, JP, <laughs> is said, congratulations, <laughs> dear, you deserve it. Uh, yeah. That's passive constructive. It has okay. no effect on a relationship. It's wallpaper. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. my 40,000 drill sergeants would have done active destructive. Man, do you know what <laughs> tax bracket that award is going to put us into? That's a, a destructive of relationships. And yeah. there's a, a passive destructive, which is what, what's for dinner. Yeah. Now, the only <laughs> thing that works, and very important to learn it, is active constructive. Uh -huh. So in active constructive, when someone in your workplace, your spouse, a friend, comes to you with a victory, you want to put them in touch with it. And here's what I mm. said to Mandy. Uh, and it's only because I've learned this from reading the marital therapy literature. <laughs> um, uh, the first thing I had to do was to show Mandy that I knew what she was talking about. And I said, Mandy, uh -huh. was it the black and white picture of the swan that you took at Blenheim that won first prize? And she said, yeah. And I said, and then I said, that is the best black and white picture of a, a bird I've ever seen. Now, my job, and by the way, this takes a lot longer than congratulations, dear, you deserve it. Uh, For sure. <laughs> Mandy, where were you when the editor called you? So she told me. Now, verbatim, what did he say? So I, Mandy relived the experience. Mm -hmm. um, now, what do you think it is, Mandy, about your photography that was, enabled you to beat all these uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalists, the professionals? She said, well, I'm, I'm very good with gray and nuances of gray. And then I said, well, how can you use that uh, to teach the children photography and painting better? And then, uh, Mandy, that, uh, that uh, bottle of Dom Perignon that's been sitting for 10 years in the refrigerator, let's open it up and celebrate. Now, empirically, when you learn active, constructive responding, uh, love and commitment go up, sex gets better, and divorce goes down. So the first <laughs> technique that's very important in the workplace is uh, not remedial about what's going wrong, but rather celebrating appropriately and putting people in touch mm. with their strengths and their victories. Well, it's such a wonderful story, more than a story, reality. You know, I had a number of episodes, Marty, where we were talking about feedback being as a gift, as an example, with Melody Upson, which is a different type of actually of dialogue where you are receiving a feedback that is going to help you to grow, actually. And sometimes it's tough feedback, but the way it's delivered is, is super important. On the other hand, as you said, you really need to do a proper celebration of people. And it cannot just be congrats, my friends, <laughs> and uh, you know, the tap on the shoulder. It, it, it doesn't make it, or great job, it doesn't make it. So I think what you said resonates so well with me in terms of being so specific about the moment, the lived experience of the person, making her reflect on actually what is the, what is the wonderful power she had in her to get that done. And, and so that you can build it and go, be, go, go higher, actually. Wonderful. Lo love it. Uh, no, I, li I, li I like to discuss, Marty, something you already mentioned in our dialogue, a growing and endemic issue of our society and workplace, mental health. I think it's a big deal. Everywhere I go, 
Mental health disorders are among the most burdensome health concerns in the U.S. Near, nearly one in five U.S. adults aged 18 or older reported uh, any mental illness since 2022. In addition, 71% of adults reported at least one symptom of stress, such as a headache or feeling overwhelmed or anxious. And according to a recent report from the Center for Disease Prevention, only 57% of employees report moderate depression, and 40% of those who report severe depression actually receive treatment to control their symptoms. And the last number, I know enough numbers, but it's, it's actually an incredible number. Only 3% of leaders and managers talk about mental health. So if you were Marty today, I think you do a fantastic job, the CEO of an organization, if you're a small business with 50 people, or let's say on the other extreme, the CEO of a super large organization with 100,000 people, how would you drive the cultural change in that company so that every manager, every individual feels ready, first of all, to discuss openly mental health issues, and obviously as a result, help to build a workplace with high satisfaction and a real lived experience of well-being? What that would look like? Good. Now, I have something very different to say about this from okay. most psychologists. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you where I'm coming from about this, JP. Um, yeah. I wrote five editions of Abnormal Psychology, a mm. best-selling uh, textbook, uh, over the course of 25 years. And every five years, I would rewrite it, incorporating what was new in therapy and drugs for mental illness. Yep. Well, we reached a 60% barrier, and that is essentially, over the last 25 years, nothing changed. And the 60% barrier, roughly to summarize an enormous literature, was yep. uh, uh, psychotherapy and uh, medication, uh, for example, for depression, worked about 60% of the time against a 40% placebo rate. Not very good. In fact, I wrote a Guy de Michelin to psychotherapy and drugs <laughs> in which I gave psychotherapy and drugs uh, about 1.5 stars. Not very okay. good. Yeah. So given essentially uh, a fairly anemic world of hmm. medication and psychotherapy for depression and anxiety, what should we do in the workplace? And this was one of my reasons for founding Positive Psychology. Hmm. Working not on relieving depression or relieving anxiety head on, but on building PERMA, building hmm. positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment buffers against the yeah. mental illnesses. And it works. There are good outcome studies of it. So here's my main advice uh, to managers of small and large companies. It is yep. important, it, it's not your job to treat mental illness. And in fact, we don't do it very well, even when you turn it to professionals. Yep. But we do know how, as managers, as human beings, and as psychologists, to build well being. Building hmm. well being by coaching by many of the techniques which are free and publicly available, buffers yep. against the mental illnesses. So for me, the job of the future manager mm -hmm. is the following. We should say to them, uh, you know, we hold you accountable for productivity, and we promote you on the basis of how you do with productivity. We've yep. got a mental illness, mental health epidemic going on here. We're going to hold you responsible for PERMA. That is, we're going to measure it at time one, and it's your job to build the well-being of your team. And we're going to hold you accountable and promote accordingly, not only because we believe PERMA buffers against mental illness, but very important, yeah. building PERMA increases productivity. 
So that's my very different take on what our managers in big corporations should be doing now. Well, I think it's a fantastic, uh, you know, framework in, in a way. You know, in, in enterprise these days, we talk about OKRs as, you know, so the key results, and there's always a lot of KPIs and measurement about productivity, performance, financials, of course, need it. But I think the way you apply on top of that, that PERMA framework is a great one. And something that I believe uh, there's a lot of value to build into a large and small organization since day one. So, and by the way, I love as well the, the fact you elevated coaching as something critical to being a good manager. I actually believe a lot was one of my episodes, being a coach-like manager, a coach-like leader in, in the attitude you have, in a way you are here to help grow people as opposed just to let people know what they got to do every single minute of their lives. Uh, so anyway, I think we, we converge on, on a lot of the, the same beliefs, Martin. Now I'd like to go back to, in a way, the M, or more than the M, actually, maybe a uh, related discussion on purpose. Having a clear purpose has become a critical success factor for people, and even organization, actually. As you know, there's a number. In my home country, in France, we have what we call entreprise à mission, mission-led enterprise. It's actually a legal status. It is. So it's not just marketing, it's real where you you'd go and define your raison d'être, and then there's a, a committee that actually correlates the work you do to drive that raison d'être into impact, and so on and so forth. So I think this is something we've been talking a lot in my podcast. In one of the episodes, I spoke to Akhtar Bacha, who is an expert on social impact and the author of a book called Purpose Mindset. And he made a great point that as a leader, your role is not to manage, but to synchronize your people's purpose, which I loved. I think it was wonderful to hear that synchronization of the people's purpose. So I think you argue that when it comes to leadership, questions of purpose and meaning are harder to come up with, and that maturing is a better substitute. Again, coming back to your PERMA and, and the evolution of the M to maturing. So could you, again, maybe elaborate a little bit more about why matching is so important today as people and organizations are looking for a purpose in lives or in accomplishing of their work and mission as organizations? Yes, I, I think it's, it's crucial for high management to make the mission of the company clear. And at the mid-level, it's very important for mid-level managers uh, to instill meaning, mattering, and purpose in the people they work with. Uh, and uh, uh, importantly, uh, mattering is well measurable. And uh, one important difference between mattering and purpose is that purpose can be entirely selfish. But mm. meaning and mattering have to do with relationships with larger things, the family, the company, and the world. So the sense of purpose that I believe is important for management is uh, belonging to and serving something that uh, people believe is bigger than they are and yep. being in a mattering relationship with it mm. so that if you vanished the uh team, the company, your family would be greatly impoverished. So it's very important to build mattering and meaning uh, into work. And how, would, and how would you again coach and advise uh, managers again back to this uh, company if you are the CEO to drive that actually to drive maturing, meaning and purpose their employees? What should they do differently? Well, the very first thing to do is to measure. So at uh -huh. time one, there are very simple free measures of PERMA. And you can yep. ask the question for your entire workforce, what is their level of PERMA? Hmm. Then I think it's important for management to say, we value the well-being of workers. We value PERMA, and part of the job of management is to measurably increase it. And there are yep. lots of techniques for doing that. 
It's highly coachable. Managers can be turned into coaches. And by the way, that enriches the jobs of managers. And then it's important to reward and promote those managers who measurably increase PERMA. And I want to say that's not just important uh, humanly. Uh, If you're a CEO that only cares about profit, the evidence is now quite compelling that increasing PERMA increases profitability. Hmm. I think uh, it, it, is, uh, it is, again, getting proven uh, again and again, Martin, and, and it's great to see actually a lot of uh, new studies coming up with that evidence. Now, I'd like, I like us to dig down on leadership. This is a big world being used in different contexts. And as you know, the foundational work you built has inspired a school of leadership called Positive Leadership, which uh, you know is uh, obviously something I'm very keen about personally and it builds on your work and your peers but also from neuroscience mindfulness and some other disciplines well so what is your own definition of a positive leader and what would you recommend to a young passionate graduate okay or maybe a social entrepreneur which which is a person I, i love meeting with all the time to grow and learn on how to behave and to become a positive leader I think uh, people working in leadership have focused on the wrong thing. They focused on the techniques that leaders used, and they focused on the personality of leaders. Hmm. I have a very different take. Focus on the followers. I've met leaders in many domains of life, and the most important thing about good leadership is that it's highly heterogeneous. People do it in different ways. But what is the same is what happens to followers under good leadership. Under good leadership, followers grow in PERMA. So Mm -hmm. from my point of view, it doesn't do all that much good to dissect the personality of leaders nor their techniques, but rather to be quite stark about it. Measure the PERMA of followers. Look who increases it. Those people who increase PERMA are our yeah. best leaders. I think it's so true. I think building that incredible people legacy when you, are, when you, you have an opportunity to lead a team, whatever team it is. And, and of course, the five pieces of PERMA is a, is a great framework to, to measure that and to see the, the growing impact you have with the community organization. So I think it makes tons of sense, Martin. Now, I'd like to shift to uh, the new AI era, Martin, because you and I discussed that before this call, and I was, I was so excited, inspired by some of the new discovery you've made yourself, uh, because I know you love experimenting with technology. I understand, I know you've been using chat GPT and equivalent models, even from China. So <laughs> I, 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 I'd love us really to understand the way you've seen AI uh, that is being used by, I think, one of your students being actually helping you. And first of all, you know, helping you actually in terms of your job, what you do, and maybe being more productive, but also being actually still still very much multi responding to the questions. And, and the way it's been helping you and others now to build what we what you call the personal your personal story or personal narratives, so would you mind talking about those two things? First of all, explaining our audience what is this personal narrative all about and why it's so critical to be able to build your own life story as part of your identity, and then we can go and get into the conversational AI and what does uh, Martin GPT looks like. <laughs> um. Like many of us, uh, I've been working full-time for the last eight months on AI and positive psychology. It's the most revolutionary development in psychology in my lifetime. So there are three things I want to tell you about JP, and the first is about narrative identity. Now, as a therapist and a coach, what I do in the first month is I try to get to know my client. I try to find out what their life story is. 
And uh, if I'm good at it, uh, mm -hmm. I, I get someplace, but it's difficult. So the first thing we did with Chat 4.0 was to uh, teach it the notion of narrative identity. What is a person's life story? So we had yeah. to go back and forth until we were sure that Chat understood what an identity was. Now, here is the very surprising part. We then asked 26 people to give mm -hmm. us 50 random thoughts over the next 48 hours. Like, I'm hungry. These <laughs> chocolate chip cookies aren't any good. My students are failing. And then we uh, went to chat and we said, here are 50 random thoughts from a person, and here are their demographics, religion, age, education. Yep. What's their narrative identity? <laughs> Oomph. What we got uh, yeah. was astonishing. 25, huh. it gives you a, a 750 word life story from this yep. meager information. And 25 <laughs> of the 26 people said it was totally accurate or mostly accurate. And the majority wow. uh, said they learned something new and were surprised. So the first thing that we can do with coaching and therapy is to greatly short circuit the first month yeah. by using AI to assist with narrative identity. Hmm. The second thing, JP, that we did, what you do in the second month as a therapist yep. or a coach is you plan out treatment. Yep. That is, you ask what interventions might be useful here. So yep. we asked AI, give us, here's, here's, here's the narrative identity you gave us. Give mm -hmm. us a treatment plan. And mm -hmm. again, uh, did just as well as I would have done, if not better. So hmm. uh, we short-circuited the second month. So the bottom line of the first two findings, JP, is yeah. that we can make coaching and therapy, even at the managerial level, by the way, uh, much more accurate and efficient and time-saving so that you can actually get to work on implementing the interventions. But it was the third thing that uh, yeah. knocked my socks off. Uh -huh. uh, when 4.0 came out, one of yep. my former PhDs, who's a staff yep. member at Xinhua in China, uh, mm -hmm. wrote me and said, uh, Marty, we've got lots of anxiety and depression in China, but we have a shortage of coaches and psychotherapists. So we've created a virtual Seligman. I said, what? Said, yeah. We fed it your books, your speeches. Yep. It's called Ask Martin. By the way, yep. it's free. Uh, and uh, try it out. So I yep. went to Ask Martin, and I found in my voice, simulated <laughs> in English and in yep. Mandarin, you could ask it a question. Uh, and I'll just give you an emblematic yeah, yeah, uh, thing. I, yeah. uh, every day I get several emails, people around the world asking me for advice. So yeah. a few weeks ago, uh, uh, some one young person said, uh, Professor Seligman, I, I need three pieces of advice. So I answered number one, I answered number two, and then I <laughs> said, maybe I'll take number three, which was... <laughs> In a shitty world like this, with all these terrible things going on, how can I remain yeah. happy and optimistic? Hmm. Good question. So yeah. I went to ask Martin, and it <laughs> gave me its answer, and I typed it out. The next yeah. morning I get from her, Dear Professor Seligman, thank you so much for your advice, particularly your third piece of advice, which I will carry with me for the rest of my <laughs> life. It turns out the content that Ask Martin gives uh, to better therapists than I am, it's a better mm -hmm. coach than I am, and it should be enormously useful for uh, individuals seeking a not, uh, advice and uh, for coaches and psychotherapists. So 
where we are um, six or eight months after uh, 4.0 is we yeah. have a machine that gives accurate narrative identity that does hmm. treatment planning and most importantly does better therapy than I do. That's pretty mind-blowing, Martin. It's pretty mind-blowing. And you basically are saying that you see the day almost there where we can use our AI system or co-pilot as a therapist or as a coach, right? And, but what will be your guidance to moderate or regulate, with, you know, with, say, some policymakers, such agents, if they start hallucinating, get out of control, uh, to make sure they play the right role when it comes to our mental well-being. Any any advice? Uh, yes, but I think uh, it's different as usual. Uh, <laughs> my job as a scientist, as a therapist, as a leader, has been ever since uh, my presidency of APA was to find out what was right, not mm. what what could go wrong. Present. Wrong. So my yes. first and consuming reaction to AI is look at all the good things that this can <laughs> do. Now, yeah. there are a lot of doomsayers out there who are better than I am and can see all the awful things that might happen. And yep. uh, I'll leave it to them to warn <laughs> us about them. Right now, my job in many ways is to ask the question, what's the very best help? that AI yeah. can give us. That's, that's, a, great, that's find, a great question. Fi finding out what's wrong, yeah. I hate to say it, is child's play. Finding out <laughs> what's right is genius. And I love that genius work, and I think it's wonderful to hear the, the way we can harness the potential AI uh, for, for, again, the greatness of, of humanity and society, Martin. I'm so much in agreement with you. Uh, no, uh, almost there, be, be, but I have so many questions I could ask you for so many hours. But I'd like now to finish, almost finishing, by exploring with you, Martin, the third circle of positive leadership. You know, we discussed quite a bit the first one about me, uh, the second one, me and others, relationships and the way we engage, and many, many pieces of the PERMA framework. But I'd love to talk about the, the third one, me and the world. And you talk a little bit about this one, I'd like to expand. You know, at a time where humanity is uh, confronted with some huge environmental, social, human rights issues, is there an opportunity for each one of us to drive positivity in the world? And if that's the case, do you consider altruism, philanthropy, or the opportunity for all of us to, do, to serve others with no expectation in return as a path to build our own positive mindset? In other words, does it matter? to get out in the world and have a positive impact. I, I, I'm often asked by students uh, for career advice. Mm. Uh, what should I do? And I think what I believe about that and what I tell them is the best answer I could give to your question, JP. Yep. So what I say is first, find out what you're good at. Find out what you're a natural at. Yeah. Second, ask what the world most needs. Mm -hmm. Find a career that matches what you're best at with what, yeah, the, what world the world most needs. Yep. I think it's a great, simple formula, very much uh, aligned with the ikigai, indeed, of, of the way you can... You can connect your strengths, your passion, what you could be paid for as well with what the world needs the most, actually. So uh, I love you, Martin. Now, um, I, know, you know, uh, I know you are extremely curious about the way biotechnology, neuroscience, genetics, and AI could have a transformational impact on humanity. And again, given some of the breakthrough innovation we just discussed and more happening actually on all those sciences, Imagine yourself as a young Martin again, back a few years back, <laughs> as a freshman in university, or maybe, or maybe becoming an entrepreneur or something else. What is it and what would be your calling today, Martin, if you were to start all over again in 2023? And what will be that future of positive psychology? This is the first time in my life at age 81 
that I've wished I was 21 again. I know exactly what I would be doing. Uh, neither of these things existed when I was 21. I would be working at the intersection of positive psychology, human happiness, and AI. Hmm. Wow. That's a... Uh... Well, you're already starting to do that as, as you share with us. So that's wonderful that you are igniting this new field. And, uh, and, and so let me just finish with the very last question now, obviously. I mean, I want to circle back, of course, to uh, the story with Nikki. Uh, you know, uh, so now you, have you been really able to graduate, Martin, from a grouch, obviously, to, <laughs> to a positive and happy dad, author, husband and human being and if yes can you leave us with your wisdom and if you could summarize it with three your three core beliefs in life what would that be um well at first uh, i'm no longer a grouch uh three <laughs> things happened in my lifetime uh, uh personally I went from being an anxious, depressed kid yeah. to being a uh, uh, older adult with high PERMA, largely because of positive psychology. Yeah. Secondly, the world got better. The world, by every material statistic I know, except yeah. for the rates of anxiety and depression, has gotten hmm. much better in the last 80 years. Uh, right. And third, um, my field, psychology, changed from being about misery, suffering, and conflict to being about happiness, love, and meaning. So that's been the three things that happened in my life, which make yeah. me not a grouch. <laughs> now, the question of, of uh, wisdom is a much more difficult one. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I'll refrain from uh, uh, saying the joke that the, the three best pieces of advice that I ever had was uh, don't eat at a place called Mom's, don't play <laughs> poker with someone named Doc, and don't sleep with someone who has more troubles than you do. So that will not be my advice. <laughs> so the, the three things, JP, that I think... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I can best pass on is first what I said about young people. Uh, yeah. Find the career that best matches what you're really good at with the world, yeah. what the world needs. The second, that, the second sorry, sorry. is to corporations and managers. And yeah. that is for the first time, we now know that high well being produces better productivity. So part of the job of the manager of the future is to produce high well-being in the people that we work for. And the third is uh, to the planet. And that is, uh, uh, it's oddly political. It's, it's neither nef left nor right, by the way. Mm. So mm. Uh, left-right, as I understand it, is the question of given that the ends that a society has, who should do it? Uh, yeah. The left wants uh, government to do it, the right wants individuals to do it. But my view is that it's the ends that are at issue. That mm -hmm. uh, nations, corporations, uh, are not about higher GDP. They're not about more military conquest. They're not about innovation. What they are about is high human well-being. And that mm. economics, military, innovation is all in the service of human well-being. So for me, good government changes the end to being about well-being, not the means. Well, this is such a profound uh, ending, Martin, and it has been such an inspiring, delightful, and deep conversation. And I'd like to, to say thanks a ton for the amazing contribution you had 
not just on me, but I know on millions of people, to see the positive side of the world and drive it and live it in our lives. So huge thank you, Martin, for everything you do. And again, I wish you the very best in your field intersecting with AI now, because I'm going to check this uh, v, uh, virtual Martin AI copilot very soon. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for having me here, JP. I very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you.